moment here and reflect and ponder a bit about this. Why should reason play such a vital role when we're dealing with ethics? You probably have taken courses in, in religion where the morality is never based on reason. Morality is based on either creeds or it's based on, based on commands. It's based on principles, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Am I right? That's how morality is usually defined in religion. And here you are in a course of ethics, and you're told that the, one of the main ingredients in ethics is reason. Isn't that interesting? Why would you say that that is so? Why? Can you think of any reasons why the emphasis is placed so heavily on reason? Because there's nothing else, ladies and gentlemen, to rely oneself on. There's no commands from the outside that tell you this is right, this is wrong. So the only way that you can really decipher for yourself if an act is indeed ethical is by actually using your reason. And that is why we said that ethics is actually based on natural law. Often we think of ethics as morality and we think that ethics has a lot to do with religion, but that is not the case. Ethics and religion, most of the time, travel more or less along the same line and reach the same conclusions, but they do it differently. Morality does it by relying on commands from the outside, either by God or depending on what you believe in. By tradition, it could be tradition. That's morality. Ethics, on the contrary, relies on natural law. And natural law, the principles, the basic principles of natural law are in everyone. These principles are true whether you live 2,000 years ago, they're true whether you believe in Christ or not, they're true whether you're an atheist or you're a person of faith. They are principles that everybody has. And how do you know these principles? By using your reason. So the incredible emphasis is on reason. Now, if that's the case, then we need to be extremely careful that we're using reason correctly and we're not rationalizing. What is rationalization? What's the difference between reasoning and rationalizing? If I'm going to die and I want to eat an ice cream cone for lunch, I'm going to say to myself, and tell me whether this is reason or rationalization, I'm going to say, well, I haven't eaten breakfast, I haven't eaten lunch, and you know what? I'm not going to eat anything tonight for dinner. And besides, you know, um, it's the fastest way, especially because I feel so tired, it's the fastest way to put energy inside my body. Is this rationalizing or is it reasoning? It's rationalizing. So what is rationalizing? It's using reasoning in order to achieve what actually I want. Reason is used in order to determine the truth, to discover the truth, to find out what the truth is. That's reason. Rationalizing, on the contrary, is using reason to achieve something I want. It's not to discover the truth. So it's extremely important, as students of ethics, if we're going to be using reasoning, is to understand the danger of using rationalization. And that is why, do you remember the chart that we made on the board? A very important chart that tells us how to use reasoning. We said attraction, right? Attraction is what we all need according to become the person we're meant to be. Remember Aristotle said that the good life is actually becoming, allowing that seed to become the big tall tree that you see outside. So attractions, whether you're attracted to different shapes, different colors, different places, different people, these attractions are necessary in order to become that person. So 
In order to use reason, we're going to discover what is it that I want? What is it? The what is the first step in using reasoning. The next step is how am I going to achieve that? And this is the biggest, biggest. This is where all the reasoning comes in, or rationalizing comes in, depending on how. The how. How am I going to achieve this attraction? In order to determine if it is reasonable, if I am actually using reason or not, I am going to discover some consequences to this act. And we also said last time that consequences are negative outcomes that could occur by using this how. See, we need to know what they are. We need to understand how much harm we might be causing. If I want that ice cream cone, I need to understand how it would, how it would affect my diet. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm saying? So we're looking at the negative possible outcome that would affect me or it might affect others. All these outcomes have to be done. So these negative consequences are listed, and we also said then, once we know what they are, we put down a percentage of likelihood of these consequences of occurring. Because some might be 100 years from now. Some might be very minute, could be one percentage, but some could be 100%. Going back to the ice cream cone business, if I am allergic to dairy, which I am, one of the consequences might be that tonight I am going to throw up all night. And obviously the, the likelihood of that occurring is 100%. Because that's the kind of allergy I have. Do you understand what I'm saying? So therefore the consequences that you have here, the likelihood of occurring is extremely important. Because as we said last time, we need to see if there's a very heavy percentage then we have what is called a major evil and a major evil how did we define major evil last time unethical. huh unethical well it is unethical but what is a major evil the definition destroying individuals or yes dignity. destroying your own dignity or someone else's dignity in other words what you're doing you're causing too much harm And if that's the case, you cannot proceed with this how. Why? Because this how is unethical. And so what's the alternative then? To look for another how. Another how that would allow me to be able to achieve my attraction. In the case of the ice cream cone, what I'm really attracted probably is not so much the ice cream cone, but some kind of food. And the immediate one that I could find is the ice cream cone. So if the ice cream cone doesn't work for me because of my heavy allergy to dairy product, then I need to find either a candy bar or something, or you know whatever it is that I could eat quickly and yet help me to get my blood sugar level up so that I could feel more energetic. You see, you never compromise on the what, if it's ethical. If obviously my what is going to kill someone, then, you know, I'm a nut. And in that case, that is not, it's not what needs to be. But if your what is ethical, it means that something that you need in order to become that person you're meant to be, then by using reasoning, you and I are going to discover and analyze ethically a how by looking at consequences, the likelihood of occurring, if there is a major evil, and in that case, decide whether it's ethical or not. And if it is unethical, proceed with another alternative. Now, we also discussed that it's not that simple, that sometimes there is major evil where on both sides, that is, on both on what you want to achieve and also the how. Do you remember the case of Mary, the little girl who had the child? 
And we also said last time that if Mary could not borrow the $20 from the guy running the 7-Eleven shop where, you know, the store below where she lived, and if she has nobody else to turn to, and if she cannot find anybody to actually take her child to the emergency room at Jackson, then she needs to put away on one side the welfare of her own child and on the other side where they're pulling $20 from the cash register. And according to her, which one is less evil? Which one carries less consequences? Knowing fully well that no matter what she's going to do, something is, is going to, to be of major. Does that make sense? Yeah? So that's what we, dis we discussed last time. The, the class today, for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, is going to be looking at case studies, and it's going to be looking also at product and services. Because you see, right now we're applying to some action in your life, whether it is, you know, Mary taking care of a child, the ice cream cone business, whether you go to the movie or not instead of studying for an exam, and things of this nature. But we also need to see how it affects the products that we purchase, the corporation that we uh, buy from, whose products we buy, the clothes, the bag, the, anything that, that really, as well as the food in our lives in order to actually see whether these companies are ethical or not. And that is why I'm glad that some of you already have Shopping for a Better World. The little book that I see two of you have, anybody else brought it today? It's we're going to be really using, good. good, we're going to be using it today. Oh, it's yours, okay. So we're going, you're going to have to have the book, all right, so make sure you bring it to all your classes. So, but right now that we're going to do, that is the last part. Right now we're going to do case studies, so um, what we're going to do, each one of you now is going to uh, share. We actually have five people, so we're going to have on this side of the room three people, on this side two people. And what you're going to do is share a case study. Pedro is an athlete and he plays sports and after his game, he went to his locker room and he found out that his belongings weren't there. So in the process, they called the cops and everything and they gave them police reports, and while they give out the police report, the, when Pedro, while Pedro was writing down what he wanted, what he lost, then a coach came up to him and said, oh, do this and that, and then Pedro, meaning what? Meaning putting in extra stuff that wasn't what he really lost, and then Pedro did it, and then from there, things got it worse because there was an end. There was one. The, after that, problems came because the Pedro told what happened and he almost lost his scholarship and the coach got fired and okay. all that. So the question is, was Pedro's act ethical? Isn't that what we need to look at for a moment? All right. Tell us about the what. What is the what? To get his belonging back. To get his belonging back. Is that ethical or not? Yes. Okay. How is he going to do that by filing the police report and all of that? Yeah. How is he going to do that? Um, by, at the same time he's putting what he lost, he's putting some extra stuff. He's going to file a report with not only what he did, but also with uh, stuff that his coach had suggested in order to appease him, right? Yep. Isn't that the how? That's what yeah. we are now analyzing. Mm -hmm. What are the consequences of that? Of putting down in the police report not only what he lost, but also what his coach would like to have for himself. That's a problem. What are some of the consequences? We need to put down four or five major consequences. Uh -huh. What are they? Go to jail. Could go to jail. Okay, we put down always the consequence, then we determine the likelihood. Okay. Could go to jail. What else? Uh, the athlete can get kicked off the team. Yeah. Yeah. Lose the scholarship or being kicked off the team. 
What else? Is the coach. consequences only on the athlete, or mm -hmm. could we also do like on the coach, like shield the body? Well, on him, actually, because okay. we're looking at Pedro. At if you want to look at the, we could also do a case study on the coach. Okay. Do you understand that? And that's different. But right now we're analyzing Pedro. Yes, His act. Because he's the motive, he's the one who wrote down these things. He had the freedom not to do it, but he chose to do it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, what else is there? Um, one more. There can be like a suspension of the team, yeah. or something like that. Not actually kicked off, but a couple of games not. Well, let's see, let's see, let's say Pedro is an international student and Ah, he, he gets it back to get my home. Yeah, put it down, definitely. So now let's think, what's the likelihood of these consequences of occurring? How likely are they? How likely that he might go to jail? Five percent, one percent, ten percent, fifty percent, what? Okay, let's say 10% just for the sake of this. What about being kicked off the team? No, he wouldn't get kicked off the team since it's his, it's his coach. Huh? So he wouldn't get kicked off the team since it's his coach that's actually making him. So there's a 50% 50 50 chance. 50%? Yeah. Okay, 50%. Next one? Scholarship. Scholarship. Yeah, he will definitely lose it. Yeah, so yeah. That's very high. Ninety. Yeah. And then if he loses the scholarship, then, then he has to yeah, go so the same percentage. Same percentage? What is it? If, would it be the same percentage? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And suspension of like fifty percent. Yeah. Fifty percent. Yeah. Okay, so looking at the likelihood of occurring, you're a very high percentage, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Is there a major evil or not? Yes. yes. Definitely. Therefore, it's unethical. it is unethical. So the how is unethical, that is, him claiming on the police report not only his own lost belonging, but also his coaches, the stuff is unethical. So what's an alternative? Just write what he lost. Yeah, yeah. Right. not listen to nothing else. Yes, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Okay. No, I think we all understand. Good case study. All right. Thank you. All right. Next case study, please. Ashley was taking a very high advanced physics class, and she had an exam coming up in the next week. Throughout the week, her friends were telling her, let's go study, let's go to the library, let's meet up and study. But she had other things to do, and she put that as priority instead of studying. The day before the exam, one of her friends somehow managed to get a copy of the exam with the answers on it. So she actually took the copy, and instead of studying the night before, she studied the exact exam and went, took the exam and got an A. What's her name? Ashley. Ashley. What does Ashley want? Pass the test. She wants to pass the test. Mm -hmm. How is she going to do it? By cheating. cheating. By cheating. Automatically, what is cheating considered in our society? Unethical. Huh? Unethical. Unethical. So therefore, there's no, there's no applying reason doesn't help because we already know that it's one of the values. You see, we talked about how in our Western world, the values, the principles, guiding principles that we abide to as a society, and that's one of them that is shared by, other, by religions, by other faith traditions. And therefore, cheating, like stealing, for example, are considered unethical. Therefore, there's no need to do a case study in that stuff. It is unethical. Okay, thank you. All right, another case study, please. My wife was a girl in high school named Andrea, and she got pregnant and she had an abortion. So that's my Okay.
Okay, to tell us a little bit more. She was only 15 and 15 she, years was, old. she was scared to tell her parents that she was pregnant, so she just went on her own to an abortion clinic and had an abortion. Okay, this is a very difficult case because by that I mean um, it very much depends on her own values of life, whether she's pro-life or not. Yeah. Um, and that is something that that value, whether you're pro-choice or pro-life, in our society is being regarded as the freedom of the individual to decide. And based upon whether she's for choice or for life, her own con the consequences that we might put down, the likelihood of occurring, or the importance of those consequences will be either very high or very low according to her value. But let's say she's for life, and she did it because she just was scared of the situation okay. she was facing. Okay. Let's try to analyze it out. You want to try it that way? Was she for life? Yeah, that's okay, fine. let's say, it. okay, that's fine. But you understand that, that in there are cases when, you see, stealing, um, stealing, obviously killing, those are basic principles that are part of our society, that they're part of our, the fabric of our lives. This, on the contrary, whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, and at this time in our lives, in our Western civilization, it is a freedom of the individual to decide. So, however, let's say that she's pro-life. Is that correct? So she's 15, she's pro-life, she always believed in pro-life, that she, if she got pregnant, she would keep the baby or she would give it for adoption. However, she got very, very scared, um, and she had an abortion, right? As she's spoken, when you have a case study that is very, very um, succinct, like this one, two lines, you are allowed to ask clarification questions. Why? Because you really, I need to know more about this in order for me to analyze it. So I'm going to practice that, and I hope you do the same. How is her boy? How does her boyfriend feel about the abortion? He supports her and what she decides. Oh, okay. Does the family, would the family support her if they knew? That's what, why she was scared, because she didn't know what they would do, so that's why she didn't tell them. <coughs> okay. Any other clarification questions that you might want to, to ask? Anything? Okay, then let's proceed. So what does she want? To get rid of the baby, because she's scared. Does she so she wants she really wants an she wants it's does she want the abortion or the fact is that she I guess she wants to get rid of her fear um, what do you, which one is it according to you is it the fear or is it the baby or what well if we're looking at she's for life she's yeah, trying to get yeah, the fear yeah, yeah so, fear. so the fear of what of getting in trouble or not being able to take care of the baby. Yeah. Okay. We're facing so, the challenges of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The challenges of having a child. Yeah, a child. Very well put. That's what she wants. How is she going to do this? By having an abortion. By having an abortion. What are the consequences of this? And again, we premise by saying that she's pro-life, okay? Yeah. Because the value that we're going to give to those is based upon that. What are the consequences of that? Well, if she's religious, it would be against her religion. So therefore, how can you say, how can you translate that in, in, in consequences? Oh, it would be a sin. A sin, yeah. it, would be, it would be a sin, right? Can I write it down? Or? Yes, if you like. So therefore, being religious, this would be considered a major sin, right? Okay. What else is there? Um, if, if she's for life, then... She will, she will know that she killed her own son and that will affect her for the rest of her life. Okay. Psychological. psychological. So it's also the psychological, the fact that she committed, according to her belief, she committed murder. Yeah. And that it's not just a, a religious problem, but it will affect her psychologically. Okay? So it's the psychological. All right. 
that we have two. What else is there? She probably could face hell. What do you say? Trauma with her, with her body after the you know, abortion. Okay. Her face. Okay. We'll see the likelihood afterward. So health, health, health consequences. Okay. What about her relationship with her parents? You know, having to keep such a big secret. Secrets have an incredible way of sort of. What do you so think? It would jeopardize the relationship with her parents. Yeah, the relationship with her family. Okay, we have four down. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the likelihood of these? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the major sin, being a person of faith, would be 100%. Psychological consequences, yeah, high, very high. Health, it all do, it, this would depend on her state of present wealth, health. If she's a very healthy girl, yeah. Yeah, but they, they won't go. That what we're looking at is that oh, yes. that, that she, secret that she's yeah. gonna give inside. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Living with a secret that. Yeah. Therefore, if there is first, you need to say there is a major evil. Oh, okay. yeah, a major evil, and therefore it's unethical. Okay. So what? Are the, what's the alternative if she's for life? She could have tried speaking to her parents before she decided. Which is the simplest form. And she could have had the baby and put him up for adoption. Yeah. 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 Good, good case study. All right, you're the last one. Do we, do we understand how to do them then? All right, let's proceed then with products and services, okay? Um, can I show the book for a moment? Okay, this is the book that you're going to be using. The Better Shopping, the Better World Shopping Guide. Okay? This is a strange little book because if you leave through it, right, what do you see? You do not, you see a little record, it looks like a child's report card. Here it says computers, Carlos, computers. Um, it says the A is green disk, the A minus is IBM, Intel, Com someone read it, not me. Who wants to read it? Read it so that Carlos hears it. Okay, okay. is it D minus? Go ahead, read all of those. Let me hear all um, those grades. A, a in the A category is green disk. A minus is HP, Compact, IBM, and Intel. A B plus is Apple, Cisco, Sony, Toshiba, and Canon. A regular B is Fujitsu, AMD, Dell, Sun, Lucent. Adobe and Motorola, B minus, NEC, Packard Bell, Hitachi, F, Epson, Lexmark, Lenovo, and Imation, a C plus, Brother, and CR, Panasonic, Okeen, Maxwell, and Micron, and Sonia. A regular average C is JVC, Lenovo, and Asus, a C minus, Seagate, Seagate, ViewSonic, 3Com, Sharp, and Best Buy, a D plus, E machines, Philips, Samsung, Gold Star, or slash LG, a regular D is AST, Compact USA, and Mitsubishi, a D minus is Acer and Gateway, and an F is Microsoft, Circuit City, and GE, or General Electric. Why is the Gateway? It's the Gateway. These are based on different values. Remember we talked about values a great deal last time? And what are these values? Well, they're compounded. And the values have to do with uh, how they deal with the environment, how they deal with minorities, how they deal with women, how they deal with work principles, if there are any penalties that they have to pay, if they had accidents, <coughs> bless you, if there have been any boycotts, and so forth. So based upon all that information, they get this report card. 
based upon many things. Now, why are we doing this? Why are we looking at these companies, these products, these in order to determine this? Why? What is the reason for this? Can someone tell me why we're doing this? The practical ways to do what? To get the product out to the consumer and stuff like that. But for you, why is oh, that in this course of ethics you need to look at the products, whether it's a Nike shoe or whether it is a computer, and uh, to see how it fares according to what you believe in? Why? Because it's an extension of ethics. Mm -hmm. We just did a case study, right? And we said that then we need to move from the individual action to see how large corporations are providing services and goods to us. A business is in business for two reasons, ladies and gentlemen. One, to make money. Two, to provide a good or and a service. They're both equally important. If a company is only out there to make money, then it's your and my responsibility, according to my values, to say, no, I will not purchase this. Because large corporations are so detached from you and me right now that there's no way for them to know whether they're meeting our needs. Does Starbucks meet your need? They probably have 50 products or 100 products. But let's say that I like the 101, which means I like my coffee to be lukewarm, but then I want a little bit more cream, and I want a little bit more blah, 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 blah. Do you see what I'm saying? Starbucks cannot do it, because they're programmed all over the world, no matter where, to provide a cup of coffee in a certain way. But if I went to a mom and a papa coffee shop around the corner, when they see me every day going in and get a cup of coffee, they know exactly what my needs are, and they will provide them. So that is the problem between a small place, a small business place, which is still in touch with your needs, and a large multinational corporation that is no longer have any. So how do we get in, how do we let the multinational corporation know that our needs are not being met by boycotting them? Because the only way they can actually say is by looking at the stocks, and when the stocks go up, they know that what they provide is good. When the stocks go down, they mean something is wrong. As simple as that, that is the ethical responsibility that you and I have today. To actually look at all the stuff, the shoes, the glasses, the clothes that you wear. Nike, for example, well, let's, I always criticize, or critique better still, critique, because it is a critique, Nike. Let me, let me move on to Nestle. You all know Nestle, right? These are major, major corporations. As you know, Nestle produces so many things. They also produce infant formula. And one of the problems with, um, with the infant formula that it's being given to nursing mothers in the first year, the first month of the baby's life, especially in small villages in Africa, they give them enough so that the mother will be able to nurse the baby for a month. And then they say, OK, it costs so much. Usually the mother cannot afford it, and the story, as you know, it's very simple. The infant mortality in Africa is really based upon this. That they can no longer, the mother's milk is gone after a month, cannot, cannot provide for the milk, and the baby dies. Now, this corporation, for example, if you feel very strongly about this, then you're going to boycott not just the infant formula, but every single product that Nestle makes. And it is a lot. Now, to help you in doing this, ladies and gentlemen, there is a very large portal, which is called the Co-op America. And um, does anybody have a computer with you? You can do it with me if you have it. If not, we'll just do it together. Basically, what this does It shows you, this, as I said, it's an enormous large portal. It's also a think tank. And basically what Co-op America does, it shows you in very simple terms 
Most of the products today, the screen, most of the products today that are being boycotted, the boycotts which are no longer in effect, or tells you the state of affairs of corporations. Recently, I don't know if you heard of, of Whole Foods, okay? Whole Foods is one of the largest, can we turn, do we need the lights on? Turn the lights on, yeah. Whole Foods is probably the largest place uh, around the country where you can buy organic food. And it used to be that people used to go there who actually just wanted good, wholesome, organic food. Right now, all the yuppies in America shop at Whole Foods. These are the people who don't want to die. They want to live forever and ever. So therefore, it's a very expensive store, but you do find practically everything organic, from the vegetables to the fruit to everything under the sun, which is organic. Why, why organic food is expensive than well, in part of the course, it's going to be to discover exactly the question that you asked. Why organic food is good for you? So stay tuned. You're going to find out. In a nutshell, for the time being, keep in mind that food which is not organic consists 99.9% .9 of the time of seeds which have been modified genetically. That is, the DNA that's been spliced and from one, for example, most strawberries today contain the genes of fish. Why? Because somehow the fish gene would, able, would be able for someone to transport strawberry for a longer period of time and keep the strawberry having a shell life longer, so to speak. Most of, the, most of those little uh, bags of chips that you buy in the machines downstairs, most of them have peanuts. Corn contains peanuts. In fact, because as you know, peanuts can be a very dangerous allergy for some people. They specifically, if you notice on the little, on the little uh, container, it says this has been produced in a facility or it may contain peanuts because they do not want any legal case, legal lawsuits in case something were to happen to you. <coughs> you follow me? Yes. So corn has been genetically modified and so forth and so forth. But it's not just genetically engineered. It's also something else. There's, there's, oh, there are many other pesticides that are being used which are very dangerous for human as well as animal life. life. So basically, the portal that you're going to see, Co-op America, tells you everything. If you want to click on Nike, it will tell you, for example, the mother company. It will tell you who sits on the board. Because it's not enough to have, let's say, 90% minorities. Uh, do they sit on the board? And are their salary? the same as others? This is especially true with women. Women often, who sit on board of large corporations, their salary are lower than the men. And if you're interested in women's rights, it's up to you, but you need to know. And if it is really an important value, that you need to boycott that company. So going back to Whole Food, which has organic food, I heard from one of my students, and I don't know yet, I'm going to read just now, was it this morning? Yeah, this morning, 9.25. Someone said there's a boycott against Whole Food, which is just started. Something about the workers. Something that they So therefore, even, nobody's immune to this. Even a company, a giant like Whole Foods, which is considered to be one of the best companies that produces organic food, and on and on and on and on, is not immune to it. Because if they do anything which is not right, which is not ethical, there's a boycott. The question is, where do you go from there? My student was saying, where am I going to shop now if I'm going to boycott a whole food? Besides growing your own food, which is, which is an option.
but it's, I don't think it's very likely at this point. I myself, I only eat organic food. Quite honestly, I don't know yet about this boycott, but I don't know what I would do. Because if I don't buy organic food at Whole Food, I don't know where I can get it. I can probably get it from two people. One is Stan Glazer in Coconut Grove on Saturday morning, and the other one is Josh on Sunday on the beach. Right on, you know, where the boardwalk is. On Sunday morning, Josh is there, and he sells organic food which is bought from uh, the state of Florida, the or small organic farmers. There are two options, but if I did not have those two options, I don't know what to do. So you see, knowing what the, what the boycotts are will help you, but at the same token, it's not necessarily a boycott that will follow. Also, if you're using Nike shoe, and you, it's up for you to research, and and really tell me about Nike. I'm not going to go into details. Mm -hmm. But if you use Nike shoes, and let's say you feel that it's not for, especially for minorities, it's definitely not for minorities, but somehow you feel that those are the only shoes that you can use as an athlete, what are you going to do? So those are difficult decisions to make. So what I'm trying to say is for you to be realistic, to understand that boycotts are there, and they are there primarily to show the major national company that actually we do not believe with what they're doing, that their values are not our values, and they need to change if we're going to continue to buy their products. That's the message we want to give. But at the same token, sometimes it's not possible, at least short term, until we find an alternative product or another pair of shoe that fits you just as well as Nike does, for example. I'm not so sure whether you can, that Nike are the only, is the only company that, that, but I've had athletes in my courses who tell me that Nike are the only shoes that they could wear as athletes, that somehow, especially basketball players, that somehow they, they cannot, they're not as good with it, which is, could also be psychological, but that's another story. So, do you understand what we're doing here? Has the light come back? No? Okay. So, do we understand a bit what I'd like you to do when you have to do, you're going to, one of your homeworks is going to choose one product or a service, and I hope you do something that you use in your lives, whether it is a clothing company, whether it is, but I also want you to see, for example, if you're doing craft, it's not enough to, to do the, the cheese slices. I want you to know what the mother company is, which is Phyllis Morris, which is one of the largest tobacco companies in the world. I want you to know what other products, yes. Did you know that? Yes. Phyllis Morris owns craft. Scary thing, isn't it? But also, what are the products Phyllis Morris has? Because you see, you might be boycotting craft but then you might be buying other, other products that Phyllis Morris is making. So therefore, you're, you're back in the same boat. So I want you to be savvy consumers, not savvy consumers the way your mothers are, used to be in order to save a dollar, but because this is a course of ethics. And as students of ethics, you need to know what's ethical and what it is not. So you're going to choose a product or a service, you're going to look at everything. Who's on the board of director? Is it foreign based or is it in the United States? How many people sit on the board of directors? How many are minorities and how many are women? What are their work principles? Have they had any liabilities in the last five years? Did they have any accidents at the workplace? Were they had it, were they was there any lawsuit against them for any reason? And what were they? And so forth and so forth. And then, based upon that, you're going to do exactly what the case study, what we did before. In other words, you're going to see those as consequences. What's the consequences of this company doing this? For example, the Nestle company, you know, giving the infant formula to nursing mothers. 
Obviously, it's infant mortality. That's one of the consequences. And then you're going to see the likelihood of those consequences, and then deciding if it's ethical or not. If it is unethical, then you're going to look for an alternative. In other words, another product that, would, that you probably would, would buy. So if you love craft slices, and if you're going to boycott Phyllis Moore's, you're going to find another cheese which is acceptable to you, which is ethical. But then you have to research that company as well, because it might be just as bad as craft. So you basically want us to do like analysis, the whole company? Yeah, the this is what, it's, it's another analysis, but instead of being what we call a case study, it is a product or a company analysis, ethical analysis. So, the little booklet, this one helps you, the better world, the better world shopping. But the biggest help will be the uh, Co-op America. The other one that will help you would be um, Food Inc. Is, already, is it already in the bookshelves? Did you see it? Did anybody see that? Food Inc. is another incredible, incredible book. And as I told you, there's the film. What's that? Yes, based upon the book. So I want you to purchase that book together with the others and look at it because that will also help you tremendously. They will discuss, for example, Monsanto, which is another very large multinational corporation that is doing so much damage. They are the ones responsible primarily for the genetic engineering and also for bovine growth hormones. Bovine growth hormones is something you're going to learn, which is actually they are, they are hormones given to cows under the form of what is called Prozelec. So it's an injection that a farmer gives to the cow every two weeks in order to produce 20% more milk with incredible, incredible problems. Uh, cancer in humans, um, the infant mortality of the calves very early, the, the, the cows uh, live such a shorter period of time. I mean, it goes on and on and on, but we'll talk about that later on. This law was passed in, uh, by the United States. The only two countries where bovine growth hormones are allowed are the United States and Canada. In Europe, they are petrol, as I mentioned to some of you, my friends, when they come from Europe, there's no way they're going to eat any cheese. Even in their pasta, which Italians always put Parmesan cheese on the pasta, there's no way because they're afraid of the bovine growth hormones. And yet, every piece of cheese, every yogurt, every gallon of milk on the supermarket, unless it's stated organic, has, might contain Prozolac. It might contain the bovine growth hormone. And Monsalto is the chief company that produces that the little injections, Prozolac, given to farmers in order to have 20% more milk. So these are the realities, and they're the realities that then we are not being told. There's no, I've never seen a gallon of milk where it says it might contain bovine growth hormones. Have you? No yogurt, no cheese. We are not being told that a tomato that you find at, at Publix might have seeds that have been genetically engineered. So the only talking about organic food or what is safe, unfortunately today, is organic food, which is actually the food that in villages around the world today, it's what farmers cultivate, it's what they produce. My mother comes from a small village in Italy with 200 people, and the farmers in that village still produce food, and when you talk about organic, they laugh at your face. They say, what is organic? Because for them, food is natural. But today, the term natural, be careful, because when people use the term natural today, it does not mean what those 200 people living in that village are, are, are growing. It doesn't mean that at all. Natural is a way to actually fool us to think that that is organic. So therefore, natural means absolutely nothing anymore today when it comes to food. The only safe food today, ladies and gentlemen, it's organic food. And we're going to learn all about that. 